sitting outside the principal's office is the worst. I mean, I understand I shouldn't have fought with that kid, even if he did have it coming, but why did they make you wait for so long? Just sitting there, thinking about what I've done and becoming a better person? Yeah, no, it's not for me. I slowly got up out of my seat when the office door opened and the principal, Mr. Mackey, beckoned me inside. He sat in a small office chair, rubbing his temples. The room itself was of a medium size and quite cluttered. He obviously had better things to do than sort out papers. This is the third time this week, Daniel. What am I going to do about you? Mr. Mackey asked. Had it really been three times already? I thought. Mr. Mackey continued. You can't be like this, busting up other kids on a whim. One more visit and I'll have to suspend you. You need to learn to keep your anger in check. I still said nothing. He sighed again, looking off into the distance. He paused before speaking. When was the last time you visited the loop? Oh no, I thought. That's not good, but there wasn't any use lying. I knew he could pull out my records with the click of a button. I... I'm not sure, I stammered. You see, Daniel, that's where your problem lies. Once you learn that the loop is good, your attitude will change for the better. You need to realize that the loop is here to help you. Mr. Mackey stood up. Come with me, Daniel. But what about my classes? I questioned. This is more important. And so I followed him. It's not like I had a choice anyways. The loop was a short ten-minute walk away from school. It was a glass building shaped like a dome. The glass was tinted a greenish-black color that quite frankly looked disgusting. The building itself was very hard to miss, being in the center of my small town and quite large, almost three kilometers in circumference. I followed Mr. Mackey in through the front door, which led into a reception-like area. It had a couple of potted plants and seating areas on either side of the front desk. But most striking of all was the banner at the center of the room which had the words, The Loop is Good, written on it. We made our way to the front desk where there was a woman sitting behind a computer. And she smiled at us and held up a small card reader. I pulled a small, green, plastic card from my pocket and placed it on the reader, which then flashed green. Mr. Maggie did the same and we made our way through the door on the left-hand side. Inside the main room of the loop was a walking track that stretched its way around the entire length of the building. Because of the shape and structure of the loop, it felt like a greenhouse in there. As such, the air was always foggy, making it impossible to see to the other side. It was also impossible not to sweat. It was always dotted with people who were already walking the loop and keeping pace with the drums that seemed to emanate from below the building. Yeah, drums. A big hollow rumble that filled the air every few seconds. As well as drums, there was a couple of speaker phones dotted around the loop that played the same pre-recorded message. The loop is good. The loop protects. The loop helps. The loop restores. The loop is safe. The loop is good. This message always unnerved me for reasons I don't even know. It just seemed off. The voice that spoke the message seemed a little too cheery, too bright. I hated it. We quickly made our way onto the track and began walking, making sure to stay in sync with the drums. A huffing and puffing, Mr. Mackey turned to me. Isn't this great? A chance to clear the mind, be set free from all anxiety. I didn't see it that way. Occasionally, a faster walker would overtake us. When that happened, Mr. Mackey would smile and wave. The loop is good, he would say cheerfully, and the passerby would respond in kind and quickly continue on. In the middle and the outskirts of the loop, 
were a group of people that the townspeople called guides. I called them freaks. Their limbs seemed to be too long, their heads disproportionately large, and they only spoke in harsh, rasping tones. Almost like a soft clicking, they seemed too uncanny to be human. They were said to be caretakers of the loop. They would watch over us and lead us to a better life, hence the name. But no one knew exactly who they were. The guides always wore clothing over every part of their body, not showing a single bit of skin, which always amazed me, seeing how hot it always was. Their face was covered by a mask that had a symbol of a snake biting its own tail in the shape of an infinity sign, the symbol of the loop. Every so often, if a guide sensed that you weren't in time with the drums, they would pull you away with inhuman strength and take you to a separate room. I don't exactly know what happens in there, as I have thankfully never been, but I think the screams that echo through the loop and tell me all I need to know. And people would leave that room, missing limbs and walking in strange gates, but they always rejoined the loop with renewed vigor, eager to begin again. I don't know why anyone would come here on purpose. We had walked about three laps of the loop when a gong sounded. Everyone instantly stood completely still. My heart was in my throat as I squeezed my eyes shut. The gong only meant one thing. Death. It wasn't actually as uncommon as you might think. There were rumors that went around town that if you died on the loop, you would be reincarnated as a guide. So, many older folks and people with terminal illnesses would spend most of their time just walking the loop. I, for one, didn't want to test that theory, and so I stood still with my eyes closed. Someone had died, and if you moved before the gong sounded again, you would join them. While moving or looking was not allowed, talking was, and so whispers went around the loop. People were telling each other who had died. It turned out to be Margaret Williams, an old lady who I would occasionally see on my walk to and from school. After hearing that, Mr. Mackey started talking to me. Imagine that, dying on the loop. Would that not be the best way to go? Surrounded by guys and fellow walkers. The tone in his voice disgusted me, but I knew most townspeople would agree with him. I suppressed my instincts to run as far away as I could and stood there until the gong sounded again. Once it did, I breathed a sigh of relief and continued walking the loop. Margaret's body was gone, of course, and taken by the guides to who knows where. We were nearing the end of the loop, and so I turned to go off. Mr. Mackey called out to me, Daniel, you're leaving so soon. Surely you have another hour or two left in you. I shrugged him off and kept walking. The loop is good, Daniel, he called out again. While I was walking, I turned around to face him, but I felt myself bump into something. I turned around again and found myself face to face with the guide. I stood in complete fear. This was the closest I had ever been to one, and I just knew it was going to take me away from running into it. Oh no... I sighed as my thoughts screamed inside my head. With one swipe of its grotesquely long arm, the guide started to drag me along to the area that they take all of their victims to. I was screaming and batting away the guide, but it was no use. I was powerless to this creature. No one stepped in to help, no one even acknowledged the fact that this was going on. They knew better. It was inches away from pulling me into the room before I felt a hand on my shoulder. The guide instantly stopped and turned to the owner of that hand. It was Ernest Finch. Ernest was sort of revered in my town. He had the longest loop run ever recorded, a whopping 32 hours spent walking it. Because of that, my town hailed him as a sort of hero, or even priest of the loop. Even the guide seemed to steer clear from him and not give him any trouble. And here he was, protecting me. Ernest looked at the guy with a sort of stoic expression before simply saying, It's not his time. 
let him go. The guide growled under the mask, but still dropped me to the floor. Free from the guide, I rushed to thank Ernest, but stopped in my tracks when I felt a sharp, searing sensation on my right wrist. I turned around and the guide had both of its hands around it, muttering in a language I couldn't understand. After a few seconds, it released its grip and I took a look at my wrist. On it, like a tattoo, was the infinity snake, the, the symbol of the loop. I looked at it in horror. What the hell is this? I thought. I tried rubbing it off to no avail. The, the symbol just wouldn't come off. I, I, I tried to find Ernest to get some help, but both him and the guide had disappeared. Resolving to myself to deal with it later, I hurried away, eager to not spend another second in this cursed place and thankful to still have all of my body parts. I rushed through the door and scanned my card at the reader. The screen lit up and said, Time elapsed, two hours and 48 minutes. Good, I thought. That should give me a couple more weeks. You see... It isn't compulsory to walk the loop, but if you don't do it too often, people start giving you strange looks, as if there was something wrong with you. I just keep my head down and walk the bare minimum, hoping to not attract attention, counting down the days before I can leave this damn town, never to return. And all for one reason. I hate the loop. I fumbled the palm and the coin clattered to the floor. You doing it wrong, kid? Said a voice from behind me. I turned around, but the room was, of course, empty. It was a cluttered old classroom that hadn't been used since the 1970s, and a thick layer of dust coated the old falling apart textbooks, cardboard boxes, and other various bits of assorted garbage that now lined the walls. I knew before I turned that the room would be empty, because I had chosen it to practice my magic tricks specifically because nobody ever came here. Yet, as I squinted in the semi-darkness of the room, searching for the source of the voice, I got the distinct feeling that I wasn't actually alone. Hello? I called out to the dusty garbage. Yeah? said the voice. It was a smooth, pleasing baritone. Where are you? I asked. Oh, how rude of me, said the voice. Sometimes I forget that I'm invisible. There was a shimmer of silvery dust on one of the tables, and the indistinct shadows of whatever junk had been there formed themselves into a hat. It was an old silk top hat with a bright red band, the kind of hat that magicians would have worn 50 years ago. The magician and me looked for the trick, but there was none that I could see. I smiled. Hey, how do you do that? You mean turn into a hat? Ah, but that is my greatest trick. I can never reveal my secret. I could, however, and tell you how to stop messing up that coin palm and maybe a few other special tricks, if you prove worthy. I couldn't help but grin at the absurdity of the situation. I was talking to a hat. Discreetly, I reached my hand behind my leg and pinched myself, hard. That's a myth. Pinching yourself in a dream won't really wake you up. I grinned and shook my head. Whoever this magician was, he was unbelievably good. Uh, okay, I'll bite. How do I not screw up the palm? It's simple. When you slide the coin between your fingers, just whisper these words. Orento, Besky, and Carob. I chuckled. It would be just my luck if I found out after all my practice that the key to being a good magician 
really was magic words in the end. Humoring the hat, I tried the coin palm again, this time whispering the words as I slid it between my fingers, but instead of sliding smoothly into my palm, the coin simply vanished. I turned my hand over and over again, but there was no trace of the coin. Either this magician was really good, or... Oh, what? asked the hat. Oh, was it really magic? And for the first time since the hat had spoken to me, I felt a tingle of unease run up my spine. Just relax, I told myself. It's only a hat after all. Later on, I realized that it hadn't been me the whole time myself at all, but the hat, using my inner voice as a puppet. Yeah, I guess that's right, I said. Don't be stupid, snapped the hat, its voice sharp. The voice resumed its soothing baritone as it said. I'm terribly sorry about that. Sometimes I can be an absolute beast. It's fine, I said, feeling with a growing uncertainty that it wasn't. There was a moment of silence. I cleared my throat and said, <clears> Hmm, <throat> uh, so how do I make the coin reappear? The hat laughed at this, a rumbling chuckle of amusement under which something ugly seemed to be hiding. You don't, it said. All magic requires sacrifice. Even such a small bit as making a coin disappear. The coin is the price you paid for your trick. What did you have to sacrifice to turn yourself into a hat? I asked. I was surprised that the words came out in a whisper. The hat laughed again. Oh, all this? Nothing important. Only my body, and it was odd and failing me anyway, but that's not the important question. It's not? No, the important question is, what am I going to have to sacrifice to become human again? The dread prickled up my spine again, touching each vertebra with an icy finger. I, I th think I'd better go. I said, taking a backward step towards the door. I didn't take my eyes off the hat, yet in my moment of fear, I had forgotten the most fundamental skill of a good magician. A good magician makes you look exactly where he wants you to, while the magic goes on behind your back. I felt gloved hands seize my neck from behind and squeeze so tight I thought my eyes might pop out from the pressure. The gloves, that's what I suspected they were. Empty gloves that were impossibly strong. They lifted me off the floor and shook me back and forth, my arms and legs flailing helplessly, and kicking and scratching at the body that should have been behind me but wasn't. Before my vision tunneled into complete blackness, an absurd idea struck me. I seized the gloved hands with my own. I could no longer speak, but I thought the words, Arento, Besky, Carap, as hard as I could. The pain in my neck vanished and I fell to the floor, sucking in rasping gulps of air. There was a horrible voice in my head, screaming profanities and other words which I had never heard before. I grabbed the top of the table and pulled myself up. Then, turning around... I stumbled towards the door, yet when I reached for the handle, my hand flickered, turning translucent and mist-like. My hand passed through the handle. I looked down at my body, which was flickering in between reality and insubstantiality a few times every second. I poised my hand above the handle and waited for it to become solid, becoming more and more aware of a malevolent presence behind me. A voice in my head urged me to look, to face my death like a man, but I ignored it. After a few eternal seconds, my hand became solid again, and I seized the handle and threw the door open, 
but falling out into the lighted hallway beyond. The door slammed shut behind me with a heavy thud. I lay panting on the ground, and clothes plastered in me with sweat, and stared with horror at my hand. It was translucent and mist-like, and then it wasn't there at all. I used to look out the rusted iron bars of my window and dream about being a bird. The chain that shackled me to my bed was just long enough to reach the windowsill. And so every night after my father would visit my room, I would lie awake and wait for the first rays of light to creep over the horizon. Then walk over to my window to listen to the morning's first few notes of birdsong. Their melodies were so beautiful, I knew that they must have been singing about places far away and wonderful. About sailing on the wind through the endless blue skies, looking down at the treetops that dotted the land below. Then, one morning as I lay in bed, something impossible happened. I had fallen asleep the night before and would have missed my morning bird song but for a tapping on my window. I rubbed the sleep out of my eyes and sat up to see a crow sitting outside on the sill, tapping my window with his beak. I crept over to the window and smiled at the bird. Hello, Mr. Crow. Ah, uh, hello, little boy, said the crow. I stood there dumbfounded for a moment, not knowing what else to say. And finally, after what seemed like an eternity... I forced myself to speak. You know how to talk. All birds know how to talk. It's just that not all humans know how to listen. I pushed my window open a crack until it hit against the bars. The bird cocked its head in curiosity. Uh, why are you in a cage? I think it's my destiny. It's always been this way. Huh, well, you look rather thin. Would you like something to eat? My stomach gave a weak growl. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Without another word, the crow took flight. A few minutes later, he returned with a small branch of figs. The crow watched me as I greedily devoured the fruit. After I had finished, he stared at me for a moment before speaking again. I didn't know they put people in cages. Do you think they mistook you for a bird? I don't think so, Mr. Crow. We whiled away the rest of the day talking. The crow told me all about what it was like to fly, how there was no better feeling in the world. He told me about the faraway lands he had visited when he was a young bird and could still make the journey north with the changing of the seasons. Finally, the evening came and the crow said that he had to go. The next morning he was back, however, with two more branches of figs. I thanked him for his generosity and we talked away another day. That day he even sang me a song. He didn't have a voice for singing, but I thought his song was beautiful anyway. We passed the entire fall that way and the bird's visits became the only bright spot of my life. He brought me not only figs, but cherries and walnuts too, anything small enough for him to carry. Soon, however, winter came, and with it the frost that destroyed the figs and cherries that the crow had used to bring me. His gifts became fewer and fewer, and I could tell from his tired voice that he was flying farther and farther away to get them. One morning, when the first snows of winter had fallen, the crow asked me a question. Hmm, what would you do to leave this place? He asked, cocking his head to the side. I thought for a moment, but I wasn't sure how to answer. Finally, I told the truth. I would do anything to leave this place, anything at all. The crow solemnly nodded and said, the frost isn't the only thing that winter brings. He flapped his wings once and jumped for the windowsill, 
and I didn't see him for three days. I began to fall into a deep depression. Every morning, I would still listen to the bird song, but it sounded forlorn and empty without my friend there to listen with me. The morning after the third day, my crow friend returned. It was so beautiful that day, the sun had come out from behind the clouds to melt the snow. One of the last green days before winter came in earnest. As the shadow passed over the valley in which we lived, I first mistook it for a storm cloud, but then I heard the sound. It was loud enough to crack the sky, but it wasn't thunder, it was birds. Thousands upon thousands of them descended on our home. A whirling storm of beating wings and shrieking caws. They crashed into the walls and windows, pecking at them with wild ferocity. The house shook under their assault, and their calls were so loud that I didn't even hear the windows breaking. They were not so loud, however, that I could not hear my father scream. It was over in a matter of minutes and the key to my shackles slipped under the door. I rushed over and picked it up with trembling hands, sliding it into the metal cuff around my ankle and turning it. The cuff came loose with a heavy click, and for the first time, I was free. The key to the door slipped under the jam as well, and I opened the door to the rest of the house. The place had been all but destroyed. There was splintered wood and broken glass everywhere and in the center of the living room was what remained of my father, a pile of blood-stained feathers. The birds had all flown off, but Mr. Crow sat on top of the living room fireplace, regarding me with a curious look. Now you can fly free. No more cages for you. Thank you, Mr. Crow. Will you come with me? Mr. Crow shook his head. I'm an old bird, and my journey is coming to a close, but yours is just beginning. Mr. Crow flapped his wings and took flight, and I never saw him again. As I stepped out of the front door, my bare feet touched the grass for the very first time, and I could smell the flowers and the breeze as it drifted over me. At that moment, though, my feet were firmly on the ground, my heart was soaring through endless blue sky, far above the world that I had left behind. I still wake up every morning to hear the birds sing, and when the first few notes break the silence of the early dawn, I think of Mr. Crow, and I smile. I was lying alone in my room when I heard the voice deep and crackly coming from beneath my bed. Hey, the voice called out. I told myself I was just imagining it. Hey, kid, the voice repeated. I drew my knees up to my chest and ducked my head under the blanket, trying to shut out the voice and the cold wind that drifted in through the window, ruffling the curtains. Who are you? I asked. Oh, I'm the monster, underneath your bed, the voice replied. You mean you're real? What do you mean? Of course I'm real. Do you have a name? Of course I have a name. Oh, well, what is it? Frank? Frank? Yeah, is there something wrong with that? No, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, it's just not very monsterly. Well, my parents didn't want me to be a monster. R really? What did they want you to be? A dentist. <laughs> That's funny, I said. I could feel myself beginning to smile. What do your parents want you to be? Uh, I don't know. Hey, Frank? Yeah? Aren't you gonna, like, scare me or something? What? Why would I do that? Well, you're a monster, aren't you? Well, yeah, of course I am. But that doesn't mean I scare little kids. But I thought that was your job. 
It's my job to scare people, he replied, but only bad people. Am I a bad person? No, but you're not the one I'm here to scare. Who are you here to scare? I asked. The man inside your closet. The skin on my arms goose fleshed up. I wanted to ask him what he meant, but I fell silent as I heard a rustling coming from the closet. The door creaked open and I could hear soft footsteps padding towards me across the bedroom floor. I didn't dare peek out of the blanket. The footsteps stopped and I could hear heavy breathing next to me. I squeezed my eyes tight. The warm sanctuary of the blanket disappeared as it was yanked off of me. I hugged my arms around my knees and prepared for the worst. A scream shattered through the night air, followed by the sound of breaking glass. I opened my eyes a crack to see a knife lying on the carpet next to my bed, blade glinting in the moonlight. My parents rushed into the room and asked me what had happened, but I didn't know what to say. Only that someone had been hiding in my closet and they jumped out the window. My parents called 911 and the police came right away. They picked up a man called Gary Thompson, sprinting through the streets a couple of blocks away. He was covered in blood and broken glass. They found Gary's car abandoned on our property, and inside they found duct tape, knives, barbiturates, and a video camera. From what I heard, Gary's lawyer employed an insanity defense, and Gary is currently incarcerated in a state mental facility for the criminally insane. I never heard from Frank the Monster again, but the officer who arrested Gary told me that he sleeps on the floor of the facility. He tells the doctors that he's terrified of Frank, the monster under his bed. The elevator doors opened and there was nothing, no light, no sound, no indication at all that I had arrived at the 10th floor of my apartment building. My first thought was that I'd somehow gotten stuck between floors. I hit the closed door button first and when that didn't work, the emergency call button. Yet, nothing happened. Hello? I called out. My voice didn't echo and for a moment there was total silence. Then a voice replied. Who are you? The voice inquired. The voice was muffled and small. It sounded like the voice of a young boy. My name is David. I live here. There was a long pause and just as I was about to speak, the voice finally answered. No, you don't. Nobody lives here. I could feel the skin of my arms begin to wrinkle into goosebumps. I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> uh, well, what about you? Don't you live here? No, the voice replied. I don't live. The darkness beyond the door stirred, sending a cool draft into the elevator. I... Uh, I'm not sure what you mean, I said. I could hear the uncertainty growing in my voice. The darkness stirred again, and it felt as if the temperature in the elevator dropped 10 degrees. You should go, said the voice, now speaking in a hushed whisper. Quickly, before it wakes up. Dread began to squirm in my stomach like a million tiny worms. B before what wakes up? Don't you know? The voice said, more quietly still, and I felt myself leaning forward as I strained my ears to catch his words. Haven't you always known? The dreadful feeling in my stomach worsened, frothing, bubbling, and twisting as my face grew hot and wet. I didn't even know what I was supposed to know, but somehow I knew from the feeling in my gut what was waiting for me inside the dark. Even if I didn't have a name for it, I knew I had to leave. And I knew I had to leave now. How do I leave? I whispered. The darkness stirred more powerfully, 
and a blast of cold air rushed into the elevator, nearly toppling me over. There was a sound like a young boy gently sobbing. Then there was a sniffle, and the voice replied, I'll help you this time, it said. The elevator rumbled and shook, and blinding red light exploded in front of my eyes. I felt the sensation of falling, and then I realized that I was laying on my back. My eyes were too heavy to open, but I could still hear the faint sound of sirens. As I came to my senses, I slowly pushed myself up and cracked my eyes open. The light was a pounding pain in my head as I walked towards my bedroom window. The parking lot of my apartment building was swarmed with ambulances and police cars. My head seared with pain and the room tilted beneath me as I fell. The next time that I woke up was more or less normal. I came to find out over the next few days that the elevator in my building had malfunctioned and fallen ten floors, killing everyone inside. A firm skeptic of the supernatural, I still managed to convince myself that my experience was some kind of bizarre dream. That is, until I got a visit from a very confused lawyer who had been assigned to represent the elevator company in the lawsuit that resulted from the accident. The lawyer had gone through the trouble of obtaining surveillance footage from inside the elevator. The footage clearly showed me walking into the elevator, showed me panicking along with the others as the elevator began to shake, and finally, showed me falling as the elevator did, until the footage cut out with the crash. I couldn't explain to him everything that had happened, and after 15 minutes of very confused dialogue, he finally left. That happened three years ago, and often in my downtime, I find my mind drifting to what happened that day. My thoughts wander to the young boy's voice, but they only spend a moment there, before stirring in the dark. When I think about that darkness, something inside me begins to feel very wrong. The animal at the back of my brain begins to panic, and I feel like a trapped rat. There are no words to express what's waiting for me, but I know it's there, and I know that someday I'll finally meet it. Welcome to Sunnyville. Every day is the same for me. I get up, stretch, have a shower and shave, and after slicking my hair with brittle cream and brushing my teeth, I dress in my suit. I look in the mirror, feeling sharp as a whip. Today will be a good day. I'll help so many people. After a hearty breakfast of pancakes and sausage, I kiss my wife goodbye and drive to work. Damn, it's a swell day. I pass my neighbor, Bill, spritzing his lawn. I wave at him as I pass, and he smiles a great big smile, a single tear going down his cheek. Well, gee, best he come in for a checkup soon. I'm in the parking lot of my surgery before I know it. I smile with pearly whiteness in the mirror. Time to save lives. We've started early this morning. The nurse walks me to my office. Pick them up this morning, the poor dears. They are so lost. One of them has mutilated her body beyond all belief. I enter and see two boys. According to the nurse, one of them is a girl, but I genuinely cannot tell. Hey, fellas, I say, sitting down opposite the boys who are struggling in their chairs. So I'm to understand that one of you is a girl. A chubby one with spiky blue hair admitted to being born a girl. I tell her that she has two options. She can be a girl again, or she can be disposed of. The pink-haired young man has no choice. He's wheeled away for fixing, making the most almighty fuss as he does. The girl asks for a compromise. She says she'll live as a bachelor forever, as long as she can live a man. I suppose that's a fair compromise. After all, no one will know she's a girl from looking at her. The nurse wheels her away, 
and I lean back and relax in my chair. I turn on my record player. It muffles the sounds of electricity and screams in the next room. I decide to take lunch in the diner across the street. I'm greeted by a friendly wink from the waitress, who rings up my usual order of steak and fries. Sitting in my usual booth, I catch the eye of the young man from this morning. He smiles and waves before getting back to his date, a young woman I had treated a few days ago. Her companion had been beyond hope. It is a shame. They make a handsome couple. I see the young fella from before. She, he, also smiles at me. Despite its shortcomings, I can see them having hope. They will struggle. I certainly did when me and Bill got to Sunnyville. And now, we're the best of neighbors. I don't even dream of him anymore. In fact, I don't dream at all. It's easier that way. Welcome to Sunnyville.